Hagen, and I am the CEO of a tech company in Silicon Valley. Tonight, I want to talk to you about the humanitarian catastrophe that is occurring in Sirte, Libya right now, the massacre of Sirte. The city of Sirte, Libya has experienced repeated war crimes. <clears throat> Sirte was a town of about 75,000. It was Muammar Gaddafi's hometown and as such did receive massive investment. It was a beautiful modern city with the headquarters of the African Union. NATO bombed hospitals and apartment buildings during their intervention in uh, Libya in 2011 in Sirte. Both China Television and Telesur of Venezuela had reporters in the city at the time that have documented this. The city was surrounded by the rebels, their political opponents. One can be sure many of them were Misratans. Misrata is a local city-state that had a rivalry with many of the other areas, a rivalry that was in open war in the early part of the 20th century. People stayed in the city of Sirte. They were denied access to the Red Cross, food, medicine, or water as well as being bombed. If they fled the city, they were stopped at checkpoints where they could be kidnapped, beaten, or killed. It all depended on who you were, where you were stopped, who stopped you, and whether they recognized you, and what they made of you. After the encirclement of Sirt and its bombardment by NATO and subsequent attack by ground forces, the city looked like a lunar landscape. It was utterly defaced beyond recognition. The Prime Minister of Tunisia and uh, Le Monde Diplomatique both state that approximately 2 million of Libya's 6 million residents have fled the country. Amazingly, the United Nations has had refugee figures that are 10,000, 20,000, maybe now it's 50,000, but they lag by 95% the real numbers. One third of the population of the country apparently has fled. Interestingly, this was about what I estimated the level of adamant opposition to regime change was, about one-third for regime change by NATO intervention, one-third against, and one-third apolitical. This one-third that was apolitical developed a majority who opposed the NATO intervention uh, because of the ferocity of the bombardment of their country once it was clear to them that Libya was changing irrevocably. The majority of schools in Libya have been extensively damaged, contradicting the absurd claims by NATO that their precision bombing led to remarkably little destruction. The damage done to Libya through NATO bombing has been extensive and is in the tens of billions of dollars of damage. They targeted the telecommunications infrastructure and for some perverse reason they targeted schools because they suspected that loyalists were at the schools. So we can assume that many of the people of Sirte who did not embrace NATO-sponsored total destruction of their previous imperfect way of life have fled. Nonetheless, people did occasionally rise up in Sirte, and they were treated very harshly. Many in Libya did not believe Islamic extremism could take hold in their society, because in general, the concept that one person was more Muslim than another was a foreign concept to Libyans. All Libyans were Muslim and no Libyan was considered more Muslim than the next, in general. However, the core of the religious extremists in Libya were a combination of forces who had fought in Afghanistan and Iraq, exiled from Libya by Gaddafi, who suppressed religious extremism and fought a long struggle with them. The core of this movement was the LIFG, the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group. Once Libya's borders were breached and rule of law ceased, foreign fighters streamed in. Takfiri fighters streamed in from all over the Muslim world. Which countries are they from? We know that a major Islamic State figure from Bahrain visited Sirt area, Turki al Binali. Who are the foreign fighters in Libya? Who are the Al Qaeda and Islamic State groups in Libya? We know the LIFG went to Iraq and Afghanistan. They might have fielded 3,000 men or so. We know that many went to Syria, hooked up with the Islamic State there, and returned to Libya. We know that Erdogan of Turkey, the Prime Minister of Turkey at the time, colluded with these players in unseating Gaddafi, with Turkey a major broker between funneling fighters in arms from Qatar and Saudi Arabia into Libya, and then from Libya into Syria, and then from Syria back into Libya. As these countries have elites to control their borders disintegrate, the movement gets progressively easier and easier. Why is the U.S. playing with fire? Why are we bringing more firepower and military actions into these three countries? 
Why are we cooperating with a Turkey that is bombing its own people's brothers, the Kurds, in Iraq and Syria? Iraq, Syria, Libya, and Yemen. <clears throat> Why have we sold $100 billion worth of weapons to the Gulf monarchies, countries whose leaders have brothers and cousins in Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State? Why do we not take strong action when Saudi Arabia further destabilizes Yemen and invades it? Yemen will be the next Islamic State Al-Qaeda country. What do all these places have in common? The American and NATO brass are still settling scores from the Cold War. The countries they seek to overthrow are all originally Arab socialist allies of Russia. North Yemen, Libya, Syria, and Iraq were all closely affiliated with the USSR in the 70s, also Afghanistan. And of course, we are refighting the Cold War now, destabilizing the Ukraine, then acting shocked as the former Soviet Republic falls apart under the pressure of the West and its own internal tensions, unwilling to see the flaw in our allies including their ultra-rightist factions and tendencies. The common denominator is the West is aligning with ultra-rightists with sympathies to religious extremists in the Muslim world and sympathies with Nazis in the Ukraine. Each proxy war we fight tears these countries further away from their historical friendships with a now non-existent country, the USSR, replaced, of course, by Russia. It appears our generals and leaders are fighting long over wars and causing all sorts of destruction all over the world. A country once all of its security is stripped, with foreign powers funding armies and terrorist and guerrilla groups in it, is basically destroyed. Delicate webs of ancient and sometimes uneasy relationships boil over. Minority groups who might have been suppressed by the former dictators, Syria, Libya, and Iraq, are now in danger of total extermination. These are some of the geopolitical elements that work in the massacre of Syria. Islamic extremists came to bully and dictate to the people of Syria. From the minute Gaddafi's Libya began to the crap, to crack under the pressure of internal dissent. Islamic extremists, arms and special forces coming in from Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey, with the NATO Air Force and special forces streaming over it, essentially military forces 100 to 200 times greater than Libya's own army. Police had to remain silent as military warlords called the shots in all these cities, considering themselves heroes of the revolution. And many of them were uneasy in their hearts, having been delivered victory on a silver platter with the heavy lifting of air power, arms, and special forces of the United States, Canada, Norway, Netherlands, France, the United Kingdom, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey. Has ever such a small army confronted, su confronted such a formidable array of adversaries? Clinton, Hillary Clinton in Egypt boasted, the Libyan army was not with the people. Now Libya has no army. This was a warning to Mubarak. But which people were the soldiers of the Libyan army not aligned with? With this array of foreign powers, it only took a small resistance. And in fact, initially, that's what we saw. There were more journalists on the road from Brega to Benghazi. Sorry, there were more journalists on the road from Vega to Benghazi than there were revolutionaries. What is truly dumbfounding is that those of us who have wandered any of these lands, seen the ancient cultures and sites, or even those of us with an ounce of common sense knew immediately at each of these catastrophic moments of foreign intervention that we were being lied to about how evil our enemies were. And we knew that these countries would never fully recover. A violent armed revolution where at a certain point there are no rules except the rule of the gun is an unimaginable event to a Brit or an American. Though those who recall the Second World War in Europe have some sense of what this was like, but in general in Europe under the Nazi, the rule of law immediately took over. If you were Jewish, Slavic, Gypsy, Communist, or gay, you would disappear, unless you were in an Ukrainian SS unit. Returning now to Sirt, the second phase of their existence after the fall of Gaddafi's 69 revolution-based Libya, was to be lorded over by the warlords of Misrata. They were taught to forget all they had learned under Gaddafi and begin chanting new slogans to new leaders. Finally, the gates of hell truly opened. In Libya, there are hundreds of white rival warlords, but there are four main constellations of political power, in my view. First, there is a Libyan government that is internationally recognized in the east, based in Tobruk, near the Egyptian border. This government consists of people voted into office in an election with one of the lowest voter turnouts in human history, around 15%. Plus, consider that one-third of the population had already fled. What sort of democracy is this? A country that even after one-third of the population has fled is so dispirited that they do not even bother to vote. 
many candidates were removed from the lists as having been associated with the former government. The government in Tobruk is allied with the former Gaddafi era general, who acted as a protective umbrella to the people and the armed forces, which were left over from prior to the NATO intervention revolution, who had not yet been assassinated. At least one officer a day was assassinated from 2011 to practically the present time uh, because they were associated with the old government. This general's name is Khalifa Hefter. He lived 10 minutes away from the CIA headquarters in Virginia for 25 years, uh, having been spirited out of Chad by the CIA to potentially lead a, a revolt against Gaddafi. He was airdropped, airdropped back in uh, during the uh, NATO intervention by the CIA, presumably. He, he may be the lesser of many evils. Perhaps he is a good man. Perhaps he is a CIA puppet. I do not know. He runs the tattered remains of the Libyan armed forces after NATO got done running them through a meat grinder of 8,000 aerial attacks against 30,000 soldiers, which were set to about one plane load of weapons delivered as an attack against each three to four soldiers on the ground. As the air buzzed with the U.S. drones, beaming targeting information back to the special forces of the various countries, the NATO air forces, and their Islamist allies on the ground. As well as true uh, freedom fighters seeking to overthrow what they felt was an oppressive government, to be fair. Second, there is a second government in the West in Tripoli that is more oriented towards Sharia law. This is a group we brought to power by the gun, the GNC. <clears throat> Third, there are rest of groups in the South and throughout Libya who think life was a damn sight better before this so-called revolution or NATO intervention and would gladly reinstall a Gaddafi to run Libya and undo what has been done. Fourth, there is the Islamic State, a monstrous abortion of hate based on former wrongs, as Churchill once said of another party. The Islamic State is essentially an alliance between jihadists and opportunists attaching themselves to the name of jihad and Islam, and Saddam Hussein's remaining officers who joined forces with them to overthrow the Iraqi Shiite power structures and the Shiite Alawi forces that formed the core of Bashar al-Assad Syria. They rolled into Syria, built themselves up, and then attacked into Iraq. They now control parts of many countries. Without the expertise of the Ba'athist officers of Saddam Hussein, they likely would not have achieved anywhere near the results that they have. This is somewhat curious to me that uh, uh, Hussein's generals would do insert what is going on, and the answer may be that these generals thinking that they could exploit the Islamic State actually ended up under the gun themselves, which is that they themselves were the ones that were ultimately used. The Islamic State and Al-Qaeda were first strongest in Berna, which is on the northeast coast of Libya the home to native-born Libyan extremism. But the Libyan army and the Tobruk government have put some effort into uprooting them from Derna. So Derna is an area that's sort of in play. It's not fully controlled. So Sirte became the apple of the eye of the Islamic State. And they completed their takeover of Sirte in May of 2015. They demanded the Sirte mosque be handed over to them. When the local population refused, the Islamic State killed the imam. Later, they dug his body up and burned it. <clears throat> when the people rose up against them with AK-47s, they opened up on these people with heavy weapons. Caretakers of the sick were executed. Their patients were executed. Those who resisted, many of them were beheaded and crucified. The pictures are truly sickening. The population has been ordered to swear allegiance to the Islamic State. Food and water are rare, medicine is non-existent, and those who can flee are fleeing. Many will make their way to Bani Walid, the capital of Libya's largest tribe, the Warfala. Bani Walid is known as one of the cities more charitably inclined to loyalists. People feel more in common with the old Libya than the new. Sirte has been the site of other massacres by the Islamic State. Twenty Egyptian Coptic Christians were beheaded there. The Copts still use in their liturgies elements descended for, from Pharaonic Egypt 2,000 years or more before Christ. They are a small minority and they are endangered. God only knows what would happen if the Islamic State took hold in Egypt. Twenty Ethiopian Christians were beheaded by the Islamic State in Syria. Have we not reached a point where we can say enough is enough? 
Syria needs a political dialogue and, and the fighting. That is for another day. Today we speak about Libya. Obviously Yemen and Iraq as well need political dialogues and ending of fighting. We need to diffuse the grievances and conditions that have created groups like Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. I can tell you these groups are extremely profitable for those who benefit from war, who benefit from invasion and intervention and espionage, the large arms companies, the intelligence contractors. And these groups can be manipulated directly or indirectly by groups like the CIA to bring down powers that the CIA wishes to bring down, which is perhaps a factor in Libya, to put it mildly, and in Syria. And we must not be angry with the people who were fed up with Gaddafi and perhaps naively thought that inviting NATO and the Gulf states to assist in overthrowing him would lead them to live life like other people in so-called normal countries, hoping for a parliamentary government and a market economy, market economy without the iron discipline of Gaddafi's Jamaharia for those who were interested in his philosophy. Because Gaddafi did have an extensive philosophy, like Mao Zedong, he had a green book, and uh, for those who followed his philosophy, it was the idea of, a, of the dissolution of the state. But for those who didn't follow it, uh, it could have appeared perhaps nightmarish. Uh, we need the, the flow of what we need to stop the flow of weapons and fighters into Libya. We need to impose UN sanctions against countries engaged in this nefarious trade such as Qatar and Turkey. We need to expel the foreign fighters from Libya. And we need to do this through international structures that are not highly compromised. That's a, a very tall order. We have to try through the United Nations in consult with the Arab League, in consult uh, with the International Criminal Court, which is a joke. The International Criminal Court hasn't brought any charges against the Islamic State yet. Yet they still have charges open against uh, you know, uh, uh, some of the people that had, had committed no crimes whatsoever in Libya. This all, the International Criminal Court needs to have its reputation cleaned out and be depoliticized. We need to have a commission of truth and reconciliation about the NATO intervention in Libya. Prison sentences should be considered for the NATO and Gulf state leadership who violated United Nations 1973, a resolution for Tech Benghazi that was twisted into armed aggression against a, non, a country that had not invaded any other country, which is against the Charter of the United Nations, which plunged Libya into a hellish disaster for at least two-thirds of its residents, half of whom have already fled. Of course, there are many people in Libya that so dislike the previous government that they prefer what they have now. And people I've talked to seem to come from Misrata that think that what they have now is better than what they had before, but most people, plenty who don't like Gaddafi at all, say things are ten times worse now than they ever were under Gaddafi, as far as they can recollect. We need to reconsider Colin Powell's pottery barn principle that what you break you own, and take responsibility for the consequences of our actions, and allowing our leadership to live out their ego trips on the backs of the Libyans. Libya is an ancient land with connections to the eastern Mediterranean, Europe, and Africa that go back to the dawn of time. The Berber people are linked to the European people. It was part of a migration from the Middle East through North Africa into Europe. Uh, and they're related genetically to the Sami of Finland. Uh, this is a complicated land. There are uh, religious elements that uh, were connected to the Eastern Mediterranean that we still know of because of uh, migration from Libya into Central Africa that shows uh, aspects of matriarchy. Um, so on that note, let me conclude. I will post in the bottom of this video the links to the horrific description of events in Sirte. I wanted to give an overall framework because we need to take political action without an overall framework, just leaving the massacre itself, you could end up with simply uh, NATO bombing, which will not solve the problem. I've created a petition to the White House to protect the civilians of Sirte from further abuse and massacre by the Islamic State. Please click on the link below and sign it, and send it to your friends and share it. My name is Alexander Hagen. Good night and good luck. And God save the people of Sears.